I'd like to thank the Detroit Pistons for giving me this amazing opportunity. Um, you know, it's been a dream of mine since I was a young kid. A lot of sacrifice. Um, just to have this opportunity means so much to me, not only to me, but to my family, um, teammates, coaches, friends from, from Duke and from, from Franklin, Ohio. Um, you know, this is a, a special opportunity for me, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm a very competitive player. Um, I learned that over my uh, career so far. And, um, you know, just wanting to defend is a big thing for me. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I want to improve on is strength. Um, I think that'll help me offensively and defensively. So um, I've improved on it, and um, I'm continuing to do so. And I think that'll help me a lot. I look at Luke as, you know, pretty classic two guard in this league, which I think is is good. I think the flexibility that 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 Luke provides is, you know, he, he's a he's a playmaker. I mean, he's not. This is not Luke's not just as, as I said last night. He's not just a spot up shooter. I mean, he's a playmaker. And, and one of the issues we've had, you guys know, you watch us, is we haven't had a lot of secondary ball handlers on the floor. So it's really fallen to our point guards to make all the plays off the dribble and things like that. And, you know, with, with Luke, that won't be the case. I mean, he, he's a guy who can, you know, he can put the ball in his hands and he can make plays for himself and other people. So I think he provides that kind of of flexibility, but I foresee him at least for now. I mean, he's certainly a guy who could get you into offense. He did play some point at Duke. I mean, but we look at him as as a two. The Detroit Pistons were the worst shooting team in the league a year ago. So mission number one this summer is to jumpstart and reinvigorate in an evening offense, the team is hoping that Duke sharpshooter Luke Kennard will go a long way to solving their offensive woes, along with some much needed internal improvement both on and off the court. Braden Shackelford is an editor for Pistons Powered. He joined me on Wednesday to assess the impact that Kennard could potentially have on the club and the current state of the franchise. Brent, first of all, we want to uh, welcome you inside the uh, Two Man Advantage podcast, and we're excited to chat some Pistons basketball with you this afternoon. Likewise, I'm looking forward to it, Kevin. So when we look at what the Pistons did in the draft, obviously they were one of the worst shooting teams in the league a year ago. So they go out and and, uh, draft Luke Kennard, one of the most coveted scorers in this draft. So I'm just wondering your initial thoughts on uh, what the Pistons are getting in Kennard and how it helped their offense. Yeah, so you make a great point. The Pistons were last in three-point shooting last year. Uh, they lacked a secondary ball handler. Uh, they desperately needed shooting, and those are two things that Kennard can bring to the table for the Pistons immediately. Um, he's shown a lot more playmaking ability and uh, some savvy ball handling skills in summer league. I don't want to overhype him, but the way he's able to keep his dribble alive and find teammates kind of reminded me of Steph Curry a little bit. And just the way he's able to get his shot off, too. Uh, he's got one of the quickest releases. Um, He's also clutch. Yesterday in Orlando Summer League, he nailed three free throws to send the game in overtime. Uh, Game ended up going in the double overtime against the Miami Heat, and the Pistons won that. Uh, But Kennard is just savvy. He's showing that he's going to be more than a rookie in terms of his ability to pick up the game. Uh, Stan Van Gundy, what's important for him is he doesn't play rookies who don't play defense. In fact, he doesn't play anybody who doesn't play defense. And so that was really the biggest concern and knock on Kennard is, hey, he lacks athleticism, he can't play defense, but, man, he's looked athletic and ready to go on defense. Um, I would expect, assuming the Pistons re-sign Contavious Caldwell-Pope, who's their restricted free agent shooting guard, that Kennard probably plays 15 to 20 minutes. Um, if I had to give you any stats or projections for his rookie year, I would think around eight points and a couple of assists. But, you know, if the Pistons don't re-sign Contagious Caldwell-Pope, you're looking at potentially a starter 
some starter minutes for Kennard. So I expect him to make a big difference for the Pistons this year. Now, you touched on this in your first answer, but obviously uh, Stan Van Gundy has been a little bit surprised on how fast Kennard has, has picked up things defensively. So what do you think he has to work on from a defensive perspective to make sure that he's a consistent contributor on the court? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Um, Kennard at Duke, according to Stan Van Gundy, was horrible on defense. He didn't play any defense. It didn't show any effort. And so that's kind of what the Pistons were expecting to walk into. And uh, the Pistons had three practices leading up to the Orlando Summer League. And Sam Van Gundy made a complete 180. He said, you know, that Kennard is capable. He has a knack for being in the right spot. His lateral quickness is much better than, a, than they had anticipated. And so I think really with Kennard, the issue was his role at Duke. He was asked to be more the go-to scorer, and he focused a little bit less on defense. And uh, so I think it's a mindset with Kennard. I think that now that he's got a coach that's going to demand excellence from him on that end of the floor, that Kennard's going to excel. I haven't seen any defensive lapses in summer league. He's been beaten a few times for some buckets, but that's going to happen. I mean, you're playing against the best of the best. But I expect him to be able to hold his own, even as a rookie. And surprisingly, I think he'll end up turning out to be a very good defender. And as we uh, progress through Summer League, what are some of the sto storylines you're looking forward to developing or wanting to develop as the Pistons go through Summer League in Orlando? Well, the thing I'm looking forward to most is uh, Luke Kennard and uh, Henry Ellenson and seeing how, the, how they're going to fit or how ready they are for this Pistons roster this year. Sam Van Gundy is notoriously tough on rookies. And the Pistons have zero cap space. And they're not likely to make any trades with Reggie Jackson and Andre Drummond having perceived lower trade values after down years. So the best chance for the Pistons to get better is internal development. And so that puts a premium on these rookies and their performances. Or I guess second-year player for Henry Ellenson, who was Detroit's first-round pick last year. And they've looked really good. Um, I think that both have been encouraging, as I mentioned with Kennard. He will most likely have about 15 to 20 minutes in the rotation next season. And I could see Ellenson doing the same. And why Ellenson is maybe just as important, if not more, uh, than Kennard is he's on a rookie deal. And the guy ahead of him, John Lure, is in the midst of a four-year, $44 million contract. And for a team with limited cap space that's going to be pushing the hard cap and luxury tax this season, they could be looking to clear salaries out. So if Henry Ellenson proves to be – able and ready, uh, it's likely that they could look to John Lohr, the Pistons could look to John Lohr to move him and create some additional salary cap. And when we look at the Pistons, can you talk about the importance of finding leadership? I, I, I look at this team and I look at uh, a lot of moving parts that are individually talented, but the Pistons don't seem to have uh, an on-court or leader that can take over the game from a maturity leadership perspective. So can you talk to me about uh, finding uh, vocal leaders on and off the court for the Pistons? Yeah, so that is one of the most underrated components uh, for the casual fan. You know, when fans are looking at rosters and they look at all these talented pieces and they do their projections, they often don't consider the player themselves and their mental makeup. And with the Pistons, to your point, they really lacked uh, on the court leader. Uh, I would say a couple of years ago, Marcus Smart, or excuse me, Marcus Morris was their uh, emotional and locker room leader. And then you know Reggie Jackson stepped in, and he was really good during the 15-16 season, but not much of a vocal presence. And then last year, he took a step back with his uh, tendonitis. And then Andre Drummond, you know, he's the most talented player on the team. He should be their best player, but he's not. And he's also a very quiet person. So it's a really weird dynamic on the team because there isn't a guy that just has the skill set to back up the, the leadership qualities or even really has the qualities. Um, I thought maybe Contavious Caldwell-Pope was transitioning to that role last year. He had a really good 10-15 game stretch before he got a shoulder injury. Uh, but he's also a pretty quiet person. So 
I think for the Pistons to be successful this season, they need to have um, their hardest workers be their best players, which is Reggie Jackson and Andre Drummond. And I think those two have to start leading by example, you know, stop being – uh, so selfish on their touches uh, in the game, look to make the right play, not just the best play for themselves. And I think if that happens, the Pistons could potentially be a five seed, especially with the East getting as weak as it is. So I look for it to be a combination of Reggie Jackson and Andre Drummond because ultimately they are what will make or break the Pistons this season. I did it ask me about the progression of to buy it. Tobias Harris, who was one of the more more uh, consistent players. So can you talk to me about his development and his importance uh, to the club? Tobias Harris is the most professional player on the Pistons. He is a total team first guy. He came off the bench this year, despite probably being their best player, uh, definitely the most consistent player to your point. And he's a guy that every year he works to get a little bit better at something. His first offseason with Detroit, he needed to be a little bit better of a three-point shooter, and he did that. He improved his three-point percentage. Um, He's always been a great one-on-one player, but you worried about his defense. He's got some lateral quickness limitations, but he's became a passable defender, and he is is just a workhorse. He does everything he can to get better and improve this team. The problem with Tobias is he does have some athletic limitations, so I do wonder what his feeling is. Maybe it's a 20-point score, eight rebounds, and a couple assists per game. The Pistons would definitely take that. But I think that he's just going to continue to get better, even if he's not uh, LeBron James or Paul George athletically. Um, and the Pistons really need that. They need a go-to score, and they need a guy that's going to lead by example. As I mentioned, they don't really have that yet with their best two players, Reggie Jackson and Andre Drummond. Now, when we look at the Pistons, how uh, do you think the roster has improved uh, this summer? Obviously, you talked about internal development, and I intend to agree with you because the Pistons really don't have a flexibility to do anything free agency-wise this summer. So how do you think the Pistons roster has improved with that as a backdrop to that question? Right. So the Pistons, as we mentioned, were a terrible shooting team last year. So their two offseason moves so far have been draft Luke Kennard, arguably the best shooter in the draft, and an excellent scorer and secondary ball handler, all things that the Pistons lack. And they also added Langston Galloway on a reported three-year, $21 million deal. And Galloway is a combo guard. Despite only being 6'2", he's an excellent defender. He can play the one, he can play the two. And Galloway's a career 37% shooter. So what Galloway brings is much like what Kennard brings, but it's proven at the NBA level. He's a scorer. He's a shooter. Um, he offers some position versatility. And more importantly, he provides insurance for Reggie Jackson should he take another step back with his injury. You know, a lot of reports are coming out that Reggie should be good to go this year and that this tendonitis is sort of a – three- or four-year cyclical event. Uh, He had a similar injury and surgery in Oklahoma City and bounced back just fine. But, you know, a 26-year-old Reggie Jackson versus a 23-year-old Reggie Jackson bouncing back uh, with more NBA minutes could be different. So the Pistons are hedging their bets. They're they're getting deeper uh, on their roster, and I think that they're adding more scoring and, and guard depth, which is the biggest weakness last year. And can you talk to me about uh, Stan Van Gundy and the way he's building the roster? Obviously, he's entering his uh, third season with the club. And where do you think the Pistons are under his leadership? And where do you see them progressing moving forward? So the Pistons have completely overhauled their roster in the Stan Van Gundy era. I think the only player remaining that Stan Van Gundy inherited was Andre Drummond. And what Stan Van Gundy has been able to do with this roster in just three seasons is remarkable. He turned a Kyle Singler, Josh Smith, Brandon Jennings roster uh, into a Reggie Jackson, Tobias Harris, um, draft, just drafted Luke Kennard, excuse me, uh, Kavis Colombo Pope he also inherited. Uh, but he's also added Marcus uh, Morris. He's added just so much talent to this roster. Where Stan Van Gundy gets in trouble is he's added a lot of 
really good players, but he hasn't had that internal development from his younger players. Stanley Johnson, his rookie season, he averaged eight points and four rebounds in about 20 minutes a game. His second year, he took a step back, four points, two rebounds. His shooting numbers dipped. And a lot of people wonder if Stanley Johnson, who's a self-expressed knucklehead, uh, maybe got in Stan Van Gundy's doghouse. But the reality is, is with this team, we're not a big market. We're not going to be a free agent destination unless we're a competitor. You have to have that internal development. So Stan Van Gundy's done a great job of making a presentable, competitive roster, but for them to take the next step, they need to have internal development with their rookie contracts. They need to hit strike gold with that. And then they also need Andre Drummond to develop into the superstar that they paid him to be last year. Now, when we look uh, towards training camp, what uh, training camp battles are you, you most intri- uh, intrigued to see uh, how they play out? So the one I'm looking forward to most is Henry Allenson versus John Luer at the power forward position. Um, I love John Luer, and I would be shocked if the Pistons ended up moving him. Um, but if Henry Allenson proves that he's ready, he offers much of the same things that John Luer does. And by trading John Luer, the Pistons can you know clear $44 million off their books. And so that would be a really big thing to see for the team. Um, I'm also interest, interested to see Langston Gallery versus Luke Kennard. When Galloway was signed, um, the first reaction was that he would be the backup to pushing Luke Kennard into the third string uh, minutes and potentially out of the rotation. But I really think that Langston Galloway was signed to be Reggie Jackson backup. But needless to say, Luke Kennard will have to beat out Langston Galloway in order to get those uh, two minutes behind Contavious Caldwell Pope. So I'm really interested to see Luke Kennard and his progression this offseason and and some of the reports that come out of Detroit. But I'm most looking forward to seeing Allison push Sean Luer for the uh, cap ramifications for Detroit. And one other question I had for you is the impact of uh, Tom Gores. Obviously, he he still lives primarily in L.A., but he owns the team. How important do you think it is for him to sort of be more visibly uh, apparent uh, this offseason because since he's bought the team, he, he has really invested uh, in the community in terms of community service. But when you look at uh, where he is with the te- team, don't you think uh, this is an important season for his uh, perception and ownership of the team? It's a very big season. In fact, I think some have said it's sort of a crossroads um, for Gore's relationship with Van Gundy, though I think that might be a bit premature. Um, Gore's has been one of the best owners, in my opinion, in the league. Um, he's very close with the players. Uh, just last year, um, he had them all out to his summer house, and, and they, you know, had a, had a party, I'm assuming, or, and anyway, he's just been really vocal with the players. He's got a great reported relationship with Andre Drummond. Uh, he's given Stan Van Gundy the tools to be successful by opening up his pocketbooks, which is an underrated characteristic for any owner. Um, Detroit, for example, is pushing the hard cap and luxury tax, assuming they re-sign KTP, and they didn't even make a playoffs last year. So they have one of the highest paid rosters with some of the lowest performing talent, and Gores is willing to do that. Um, so that said, at some point in time, Gores is going to need to see some uh, return on his investment, and he's going to need Van Gundy to take this team to the next level. So um, in terms of community perspective, I've been really pleased with Gores as well. He really made the wanted to make a push to get into that Little Caesars Arena in downtown or midtown Detroit. And uh, he's done that, so he's made the team feel more homey and, and less outside in Auburn Hills. And that's a move that's been really well received uh, in the Detroit area. So I think he's been a great owner. Um, I think that he's did, did a great job in hiring Van Gundy and giving him the power to be uh, president of basketball operations. But I do think that as an owner, there's only, only so much he can do. Now it's up to Stan Van Gundy and Jeff Bauer to get this team going. Now, when we look at uh, the Pistons and their prospects of resigning Contavious Caldwell-Pope, obviously the report came out that the Nets are 
heavy after the season. So what, what do you think are Detroit's uh, chances to retain his services this offseason? So Detroit is in a really good position to re, uh, retain him. He's a restricted free agent, which means they have the opportunity to match any offer. Um, what puts a interesting wrinkle in this situation is they signed Langston Galloway with their mid-level exception to a three-year, $21 million deal, which means that if the Nets offered Contavious Caldwell Pope the max, Detroit technically wouldn't have the money to match it. They'd have to move about $7 million in cap space, which is the equivalent of Boban Marjanovic's contract. So right now I think the Pistons are feeling really good about themselves because Contavious Caldwell Pope hasn't even received an offer yet, which is just shocking. Um, the Nets have a standing offer to Otto Porter right now, which means that and it's a max contract at $106 million, which means that they don't have the cap space to sign Contavious Caldwell Pope, but reports are that the Wizards are planning on matching. So now everyone's sort of going back to that report that you heard, Kevin, and that, okay, are they still interested? Are the Nets still interested in Contavious Caldwell Pope? And if they are, if they do offer the max, what does Detroit do? I mean, Detroit has been very vocal about wanting to retain his services, but signing Galloway um, sort of has left some people confused about really their their desire to retain Caldwell Pope at the max. Ultimately, I think they do resign him. I do think Detroit resigns Contavious Caldwell Pope. But if Otto Porter ends up going back to the Wizards and the Nets end up matching, um, it'll put them in a really interesting situation. But my final question for you is, what do you think uh, the ceiling is for this team as they enter year four with Stan Van Gundy? If Reggie Jackson is healthy, and if Andre Drummond just shows a little bit of growth, this team is the five seed in the Eastern Conference next year. Uh, if Reggie Jackson is 2016-2017 Reggie Jackson uh, coming off his knee tendonitis, lacks explosiveness, um, the team doesn't develop a leader, Andre Drummond stays plateaued at that 13-13 and 13 game, 13 points, 13 rebounds. Uh, I think that this could be a really long year, and then you start think, then you have to start thinking that Stan Van Gundy probably looks to trade some of his assets to reduce the payroll for an underperforming team. I think Detroit's really positioned themselves well, though, to be a five seed. Knee tendonitis uh, with the surgery that Reggie Jackson had uh, is something that he'll always battle with, but he should have another two or three seasons before it really starts flaring up again. Um, they've added some great depth with Ish Smith and Langston Galloway at the point guard position. They're obviously deep at shooting guard now with Contavious Caldwell Pope, who I only see improving, and Luke Kennard, who fills an immediate need for them. Uh, they're, this is a really deep team for Detroit, and there's really no reason that they can't be a consistent playoff contender for the next few years. Now, the obvious question is, can they ever be a title contender with this roster? And I don't think that they can be, particularly with the landscape of the NBA right now, and that you have the juggernaut Golden State Warriors that will probably be around for the next three to five years. But... This will be a competitive team, and it should be uh, a good team. And who knows, you know, when you have consistent success, suddenly uh, players start becoming more interested in your venue. So the hope is that they can build a consistent team over the next couple of years and maybe land a superstar like some of the other teams are doing. Hey, Braden, we want to uh, thank you for your insight on the Two Men in Venice podcast talking some Pistons basketball uh, this afternoon. We enjoyed uh, your perspective, uh, your perspective, and we want to thank you for your time there, buddy. Hey, thanks so much, Kevin. It was my pleasure. I'm glad to be on the show.